The map that you see in front of you now is a map of the IISS, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, that demonstrates the extent, range, and depth of conflict around the world today. The majority of those conflicts are internal conflicts. And the thesis that I'm putting forward to you today is that the nature of international relations today is such that the possibility of great power conflict is back. Arguably, its likelihood is higher now than at any point in the last 25 years. And this is because uh, two of the big powers in the world, China and Russia, are beginning to try to challenge the global predominance of the United States uh, and uh, its allies. And they're doing so uh, not only uh, on the ground, but also through their uh, declaratory uh, policy. Vladimir Putin, our commanders always have the authorization to use any means for the defense of the Russian Federation. The chief of his general staff, we must not copy foreign experience and chase after leading countries, but we must outstrip them and occupy leading positions ourselves. President Xi Jinping, we will make it our mission to see that by 2035, the modernization of our national defense and our forces is basically completed, and that by the 21st century, our people's armed forces have been fully transformed into world-class forces. And the French naval commander noting the strategic landscape is changing rapidly. China, for example, built in the last four years the equivalent of the entire French uh, Navy. And I'll put a footnote to that to say that in September 2016, the French uh, Navy was outstripped in the Mediterranean by the presence of the Chinese Navy. There were more Chinese naval vessels in the Mediterranean than there were uh, French. And at present, uh, the US administration is, of course, having a challenging time uh, in working with its NATO allies, it's working with its Asian allies, there's a degree of unpredictability in the geopolitical uh, environment. Europeans, uh, for their part, are becoming a little bit more conscious that the world is a dangerous place, but their capabilities have been hollowed out since the end of the Cold War, and perhaps even more hollowed out in the wake of the austerity that uh, they've had to conduct after 2008. Now, great power conflict isn't inevitable, but we are at an inflection point, and I think that some of the initiative is moving towards the challengers to the status quo rather than those who wish uh, to protect the status quo. But defense spending is still an interesting indicator of the distribution of effort, and you can see from that slide that still today, the United States remains by far the largest defense spender in the world, at more than US 600 billion in the last year, 38% uh, of the total. Uh, but Russia and China are uh, spending quite well themselves. The difficulty is that Russian and Chinese defense spending is not uh, very uh, transparent. Uh, for instance, China, that is indubitably the second biggest defense spender in the world, we estimate their defense expenditure at 195 billion. The official budget in China is uh, 150 billion, and the difference resides in the fact they don't put a lot of things in their defense budget. The State Council, for example, of China is in charge of arms purchases, and that's not part of their uh, defense uh, budget. Uh, the other interesting thing that has happened in uh, recent years is the way in which uh, defense spending has changed uh, region uh, by region. Since 2011, defense spending in Asia has surpassed total spending uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, and during uh, the Cold War, while uh, NATO states dedicated a high degree of their national wealth to military expenditure, uh, with defense expenditure sometimes being as high as uh, 6% uh, of GDP, almost all uh, key NATO states spending way above uh, the current declared minimum of 2%, uh, now only uh, five uh, do. Uh, and this, looks, uh, this slide shows a little bit uh, those trends. Look at those numbers in uh, 1980. France spending 3%, Germany 2.7%, Turkey 5%, the UK 6%, uh, 
the United States, uh, 6%. And then you come down all the way down to 2017, and you see those numbers rather dramatically uh, reduced. 1.9% for France, 1.1% for Germany, uh, United Kingdom just about holding it, uh, 2%. Uh, and the United States, even with this great talk, uh, about uh, making America great again and spending a lot of money to ensure the United States uh, uh, stays ahead of their peer competitors. At 3.1%, it still is a proportion of GDP, a lot less uh, than what uh, the uh, United States was spending uh, at the height uh, of uh, the Cold uh, War. Uh, China uh, is uh, the country that is moving uh, most rapidly uh, to become uh, a, a peer competitor of the United States. Uh, they have made rapid strides in the field of air-to-air -air missiles, uh, putting high-value platforms of the United States that used to be able to loiter uh, safely outside of engagement uh, zones uh, in the Taiwan Straits, for example, under great uh, risk. Uh, within the next two years, the United States will lose its monopoly on operational stealth combat aircraft with the Chinese J-20 entering service, that J-20 having stealth technology that the Chinese state stole from Western industry through uh, their uh, inte intellectual uh, property uh, theft operations. China continues uh, to pursue advanced technologies, uh, extremely high performance computing, quantum communications, AI, and what this slide is demonstrating is that they're making a lot of their advanced weapons available for uh, export. Uh, where the United States is unwilling to sell, the Chinese will often enter that vacuum. And the result is that there are more lethal weapons in more hands in more places. And the West will have to deal with an environment in which all military domains are more contested. Now, it's important also to underline that technology in itself uh, is not uh, the only factor uh, that matters. The enemy gets a vote too, as military commanders like to say. The current US National Security Advisor, General McMaster, has a nice phrase. He says there are two ways to fight the United States military, asymmetrically and stupid, and of course, countries that have less technological capacity vote for fighting uh, the United States uh, asymmetrically. And it's also true that technology is difficult to adopt within armed forces. Chinese military lacks uh, combat uh, experience. They're in the process still of developing joint doctrine uh, and training. But the point here is that China is catching up uh, fast. And Chinese defense uh, spending and military capabilities are not limited by mainland China's uh, geographic uh, borders. Uh, China is, of course, hugely concerned about maintaining its uh, sovereignty over the South uh, China Sea. Uh, and since 2013, China has reclaimed land at outposts in the South China Sea. And by 2015, uh, it reclaimed 2,900 acres of land, or 17 times more than all the other claimants uh, to that territory uh, combined. Um, and uh, while President Xi Jinping pledged in 2015 not to militarize China's islands in the South China Sea, Chinese occupied islands in the Spratlys now host munitions depots, sensor arrays, radar systems, missile shelters, as well as three 3,000 meter runways on the big uh, three islands. And together, China's presence in the Paracels and the Spratlys provides the PLA pretty comprehensive military coverage of the entire South uh, China uh, Sea. And those of us gathered here in Davos have been extremely seized by that great Chinese geoeconomic experiment, the Belt and Road Initiative. And while it is uh, primarily an economic project, the Belt and Road Initiative will be giving China uh, tremendous uh, infrastructure on which it could choose to build uh, military uh, installations, developing 
uh, a wider international uh, footprint. Uh, they already have a base um, in uh, Djibouti, uh, and they are exercising, as I said earlier, in the Baltic and Mediterranean uh, Sea. So when you hear the People's Republic of China perhaps noting with concern the occasional appearance of American, French, or British naval vessels in the South China Sea, the Chinese have been as close to the Baltics and the Mediterranean uh, themselves. Uh, now, uh, moving back uh, to Europe, uh, we are, I think, properly concerned about the resurgence of a potential uh, threat uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, Russia is a country that understands the laws of asymmetry uh, in uh, conflict. They've been able to bring different levers of state power to orchestrate the effects in causing challenges uh, in Western Europe. The conflicts in which they've engaged in Ukraine, in Syria, have served as test and evaluation laboratories for Russian technology, military doctrine, and military personnel. And Russia has demonstrated lots of anti-access, area denial, force projection capabilities that are creating uh, more challenges uh, for uh, Europe. Um, we have a map here uh, of Kaliningrad, just to remind geographically that Kaliningrad is Russian territory. It's an enclave uh, within uh, Poland. Uh, and Russia uh, has the option of potentially uh, deploying uh, intermediate range uh, weapons in Kaliningrad and without wishing uh, to frighten too much. If you look at those uh, ranges, uh, you can see that uh, Davos would be within the range of uh, Russian um, uh, 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 missiles that might be uh, deployed uh, in Kaliningrad. But actually, I don't think, personally, as a strategist, that it's Russian military deployments that are the greatest threat now uh, to uh, European security, uh, stability, and uh, prosperity. It's much more the asymmetric tactics that Russia uh, is able uh, to employ, and is doing so without limitations from domestic uh, or international uh, law. Russian strategy is to, where possible, undermine our open societies uh, from uh, uh, the inside. Uh, and there are at least three areas where people here gathered in Davos, interested in the Western liberal order, interested uh, in business and prosperity should be concerned about and the way in which Russia now exercises its state power. Uh, the first is the way in which they are leveraging their financial power, including in the private sector, potentially to purchase controlling shares in infrastructure in Europe that they might later be able to manipulate. The second is the propaganda that they are targeting steadily and effectively at Russian-speaking minorities in the Baltic states, in the Balkans, uh, and in animating pro-Russian political parties, uh, both in the, on the left and the right wings of various political spectrums. And the third is in their assertion of cyber power through interference in democratic uh, processes. And this includes the dissemination of perhaps not fake news, but junk news, trolling, uh, and we should not rule out more direct uh, interference. And we have a slide here showing RT and Sputnik, and there should be no doubt uh, that these are instruments of the Russian uh, state in order to advance uh, Russian thinking and to undermine uh, support for the open, prosperous uh, societies in the liberal uh, West. Uh, the sad fact is uh, that today's Russia does not seem to be overly invested in the current international uh, order. And um, while we worry uh, about the rules-based order being undermined from within our Western societies because of the leader that we sometimes actually elect or risk uh, electing, uh, the challenge to the rules-based order also comes from the outside. And I think Russia is a principal uh, challenger of that uh, rules-based uh, order. Coming back to the debate on uh, defense, though, again, to see quite how big uh, the gap has grown since the height of the Cold uh, War. Look at the numbers there in 1990, the kinds of forces that West Germany uh, alone uh, had 
uh, deployed or at its uh, disposal, and you add those with Italy, France, the United Kingdom, and the European command of the United States. And then you look at the figures uh, in 2015, all the way across this bottom screen, if you added up all of these charts in the bottom screen, uh, Germany, Italy, France, UK, United States, European command, they just about equal what West Germany alone had in 1990. So when people talk about uh, the hollowing out of uh, our military resources on the European uh, continent, this is the gap they're talking about. There's no argument necessarily for going back all the way to those uh, numbers, but this gap is quite an extraordinary one, especially at a time uh, when uh, Russia is determined to uh, potentially use military force more on the European continent as they have uh, in Georgia uh, and uh, in Ukraine. And just looking at uh, the personnel deployed numbers, look at those numbers from 1995, nearly 4 million, coming down over the years to just under uh, 2 million. Uh, so when people are calling for an increase in defense budgets, an increase in equipment, an increase in personnel, uh, this isn't an attempt uh, to go back uh, to the numbers of the Cold War, uh, but just uh, to begin uh, to uh, rebuild uh, from the huge cuts uh, that were optimistically taken when the Cold War ended and people thought there would be a peace dividend, and then the cuts that were additionally imposed after 2008 uh, when the economics of austerity uh, took uh, hold. Uh, so in conclusion, um, the United States and Europe are now going through a bout of what I style strategic arthritis. Uh, there is so much effort in uh, strengthening our domestic economies, on reconnecting uh, uh, with our people, on ensuring uh, social inclusion and the like, uh, understanding our electoral processes in the modern and digital age, and we have let the first mover advantage slip from us to these other anti-status quo powers, principally China uh, and uh, uh, Russia. And if I were to leave you with uh, one message, is that in geopolitics, just as in business, there is a first mover advantage. And in the last few years, Russia and China have been creating facts on the ground that complicate the maintenance of that liberal democratic order that we all champion. And if we are to sustain it, we need to gain the initiative politically and to a degree, again, even militarily. Thank you very much.